hello welcome ladies and gentlemen to today's tutorial today we are going to begin our journey looking at the reproductive system actually starting with the female reproductive system now remember that reproduction yes is a process in which you know organisms will give rise to young ones of their own kind by so doing they will ensure perpetual existence of particular species of organism in other words we want to prevent dying out or extinction of particular species of organism now one important thing is that yes whether being male reproductive system or being a female reproductive system they are going to have common you know functions that they are going to play importantly there will be four main functions which will be performed by both male and female reproductive systems yes the first one will be the production of gametes now production of gametes will happen in the gonads which we will see later on for the male is going to happen in the testes for the females is going to happen in the ovaries then apart from that yes of course you know the gonads for i mean yes the sex cells or the gametes for males will be the sperm cell for that of the female will be the egg cell which will come to then of course apart from that yes they will, these i mean gametes will have to be transported they will have to be moved from one part to another where there will be the need for fertilization to form what you call the zygote yes that is totipotent which will very eventually grow to become you know the fetus and of course you know eventually after being delivered it will become a full-blown you know organism yes apart from that yes we also be important that these gametes will have to be nourished even after fertilization yes the zygote which is formed will have to be nourished eventually to become brastricious and then eventually to become you know the embryo and of course you know to become the fetus will have to be nourished so it will be done by the kind case of the reproductive system and then finally which yes this function is also performed by the gonads will be production of hormones and these hormones will actually regulate the system itself so it will make some hormones you know estrogen you know estradiol you know progesterone you know testosterone will be made by the gonads to regulate the system itself now today we want to actually look at the female reproductive system as i've indicated actually beginning with the vulva as well as you know the vagina now for the lay person whatever you know is in pants of the female is the vagina no the external thumb what you can see with your naked eye externally or touch are known as the external genitalia or simply the vulva and then connecting you know the external genitalia to the various internal parts like the uterus will be the vagina so let's go through this quickly and then see what we have so as you can see there's a female in litotomy position as if she is getting delivered of her fetus now you, fi you find that there is this thick fold of skin thick fold of skin over the pubic bone area as well as the pubic symphysis area this mound is known as mountain of the pubis or we also call it you know mons pubis but sometimes too we can also call it you know mons veneris or mons venus so if you hear mons veneris or mons venus we are still talking about the mons pubis now this mons pubis as you can see we will have coarse hair growing over here now we said that it's thick skin therefore that stratified squamous keratinized epithelial tissue will be here yes this area too will be rich in fat there will be a lot of adipose tissue beneath it in the hypodermis area there will be a lot of adipose tissue over there okay so one thing that we find yes this one is going to form the anterior part of the vulva anterior part of the vulva you know actually now because it is thick skin or skin what will happen is that yes there will also be i mean sweat glands in there there will be sebaceous in glands there when we were explaining the skin we'll look at all those things in detail they will all be there forming parts of this you know i mean 
I mean, um, Mons pubis or Mons venus or Mons veneris that you find over here. Now you realize that, yes, as this Mons pubis, yes, descends inferiorly, okay, so from here, this is anterior, so from ante uh, inferiorly and posteriorly, posterior inferiorly, yes, on either side, then we are going to find this thick fold of skin again over here. This thick fold of skin is known as labia majora. There are two of them, one over here, and then of course, one over here. So labia majora, singular is labium majus. You know, the word labia or labium has to do with lip. And that is not surprising why, you know, some people want to engage in oral sex because, yes, there, there are lips in the oral cavity or, sorry, in the, you know, oral region around the head and head area. Then there are also lips in the perineum area. So they want to actually bring it over here. So it's not surprising to find that. So these are the larger lips and that is why we call them labia majora, labia majora. Now, these labia majora, yes, they are blending over here with the mons pubis. But we can identify this area over here anteriorly being what we call the anterior labial commissure. Anterior labial commissure. And then posteriorly, okay, actually overlying where we have the, I mean, perineal body or central tendon of the perineum. Over here, we are going to have what we call the posterior labial commissure posterior labial commissure so what this labia majora is doing is that it's serving as the outer lip so that the gateway which will actually sort of give some partial you know covering or protection to the other parts of the vulva being mainly being the labia minora labia minora now this labia majora yes will also be endowed with you know coarse hair so some people too may have hair growing around the labia majora you know as well now the labia majora will actually develop from what we call genital swellings or labial scrotal swellings labial scrotal swellings who actually or fools who actually form this you know labia majora now over here now in between these labia majora will be a cleft and that cleft okay is known as pudendal cleft pudendal cleft okay will form over there so that is with the labia you know majora labia majora now then we also have you know internally lying over here which is actually yes pinkish and it is quite fleshy compared to this one you know remember that yes because you know labia majora is continuous with the most pubis this one will also have you know of course having skin stratified squamous you know non keratinized steroid keratinized epithelium yes with hair as i said there will also be sweat glands you know sebaceous glands will be there as well then this one for labium singular form is labium minus but plural because of both of them here being labia minora labia minora now this labia minora is devoid of hair is devoid of hair of course it's also going to be devoid of sweat glands but there could be some you know sebaceous you know glands over there you know occasionally you may find those ones too there now what will happen is that yes this one yes we can see that anteriorly is related to this structure over here which will come to that's a clitoris now, this clitoris that we find here is actually a tip of the iceberg. We will get to know the full extent. Now, over here, they also meet posteriorly. Okay? So, the labium minus, okay, right one and left one will meet posteriorly to form something we call foresheet. Foresheet or foresheet will be formed posteriorly over here. Okay? So, that is the, I mean, labium, you know, I mean, labia minora now this labia minora will be formed from what we call genital swellings genital swellings and these now remember the labia majora was formed from you know i mean i mean screw to you know labio scrutal yes labio scrutal i mean swellings or fools 
these ones are formed from what we call genital foods or genital swellings. So that is one thing that we find over here. Now remember, one thing that you have to know about this labia majora, okay, let's get back just briefly. Labia majora is actually homologous, you know, they actually arose from the same, you know, embry uh, embryonic origin. So they are homologous to what we call the scrotal sac or the scrotum in males, which are actually going to hang, I mean, contain, you know, the testes. Now, for the labium, labia minora is going to be homologous to the ventral portion or the underside of the penis, the underside of the penis. So that is the labia minora, labia minora. Now, over here, we are going to have, now, around this area, okay, around this area, this opening around the, this area, we call it vestibule of the vestibule of, you know, the vulva, vestibule of the vulva. Now, this vestibule of the vulva, Yes, it's actually roughly triangular in shape. I mean, roughly triangular in shape. Then, what it's going to do is that, yes, as you can see, we are going to find this vestibule actually between, you know, the glands of the clitoris, which we are going to see the clitoris, you know, anteriorly. And then, you know, of course, it will also be related to actually the, the posterior labial commissure, you know, posterior labial you know, commissure, or actually, more specifically, to the four sheet, four sheet. So, as you can see, extending all the way to this place, actually, to the four sheet. Now, what we find is that you can see that it is actually enclosed by what we call the labia minora. Okay, we actually enclose this vestibule of the vulva. Now. In the vestibule of the vulva are certain things which actually open into the vestibule. Now there are four main things which will open into the vestibule and we can see one of them over here which we are going to get to soon. This is known as the duct okay, of the greater vestibular gland or the Bartholin's gland. So the duct of the greater vestibular gland will open into what we call the the vestibule apart from that we have the opening of the vagina as you can see over here opening of the vagina and that is what we call you know the vaginal orifice or the vaginal opening we call it introitus introitus and then a bit anteriorly we have another opening which is the opening of the external urethral orifice Standard uterine orifice over here opens into the vestibule. Then there's another one which you know is not shown over here, but we call it you know skinny's you know gland. Skinny's gland will have its ducts also opening into what we call the I mean the vestibule of the vagina, vestibule of the vagina. So that is it. That's with the vestibule of the vagina being actually the gateway okay so that these structures can actually open into the vestibule of the vagina now this i said is the clitoris now the clitoris is endowed with a lot of nerves so the, that it is highly you know erogenous the clitoris some people may also call it a c spot okay over here now this clitoris that we find here just a tip of the iceberg i'm going to show you the full extent pretty soon now what you see over here is that you can see some some kind of you know skin over here and that's what we call the hood or the prepuce of the clitoris just like the foreskin we have in males okay just like the foreskin we are going to have in males now for the clitoris what happens is that yes we don't expect that it is i mean we circumcise it as it used to be the case, okay, in most areas in, you know, the sub-Saharan Africa, where they tend to, you know, take away, you know, surgery. I mean, they use some kind of sharp, you know, I mean, materials. 
like knife to remove this clitoris so that the females become more faithful or they stay you know virgin until they get you know actually married now when this happens usually they tend to use the same you know sharp objects okay on one you know female as well as you know on another female therefore it can actually result in some kind of you know transmission of bloodborne infections bloodborne infections can be you know and that is why you know it is actually outmoded to do that apart from that you know later when they get married you know what happened is that they wouldn't be i mean aroused sexually they won't have you know that kind of sexual arousement i mean they won't have a lot of you know libido enjoyment of the sex yes even apart from that yes even there will be painful intercourse because this one you know is one of the erogenous areas so that they can help you know lubricate you know actually the i mean the you know the vulva opening of the vagina so that it can help in easy you know coitus then what happened there could be painful you know intercourse so that's why it's not very you know important to do that now over here the tip just like we have in case of males having the glans clitoris okay this is the glans clitoris males will have glans penis but for males remember that the hood or the prepuce will have to be circumcised for that one it is religiously as well as of course scientifically you know sound for you to remove the prepuce now over here attaching okay to the other part of the you know the okay so from the hood over here attaching on either side of the vulva is known as you know the i mean uh, the clitoral you know frenulum on either side clitoral frenulum will be there okay clitoral frenulum all right so actually yes this the other one which is also part of you know the the vulva is the Bartholin's gland Bartholin's gland now then the name for the Bartholin's gland is the greater vestibular gland greater vestibular gland now this Bartholin's gland yes as you can see yes as we did in actually in the peri i mean the perineum i've explained the perineum so you can go and watch that video you realize that this Bartholin's gland yes will be found in the superficial you know perineal pouch and during sexual arousal during foreplay what will happen is that you know realize that the vaginal opening the introitus will get actually lubricated and that secretion is actually coming from what we call the you know the greater vestibular gland remember that the vagina doesn't have glands you know so this greater vestibular gland will you know actually prepare the you know vaginal you know opening for easy penetration or for easy you know copulation now this greater vestibular gland yes will have a duct it's actually an exocrine gland or therefore have a duct known as you know the ducts of the greater vestibular gland or the duct of Bartholin's gland we said that it's going to open into the you know the vestibule okay now this duct is actually lined with you know simple columnar epithelial tissue simple columnar epithelial tissue now sometimes yes what will happen is that i mean there could be some infection mainly bacterial infection and it will result in formation of what we call schists okay inflammation of sorry it will result in actually so there could be i mean bacterial infection which may result in inflammation of the Bartholin's gland and that is what we call Bartholinitis. Bartholinitis. now this Bartholinitis may actually form schists in there okay may actually form schists in there and actually the most common I mean cause of this cyst formation or Bartholinitis you know actually is actually E. coli you know the gram negative you know bacilli actually so it's going to be actually the E. coli okay so E. coli will actually form I mean help to form that kind of you know Bartholin's you know schist over here will be implicated in the formation of the Bartholin schist now usually we can be treated with what we call antibiotics can actually help in that regard but sometimes you know it becomes recurrent you know i mean 
and then of course forms what we call abscess abscess will form around this area and therefore will have to be drained surgically and the preferred you know mode of surgical intervention that we have to go through is to actually make a slit through actually the abscess so once you make the slit through it then what will happen is that you can drain it and of course you suture the edges to form actually a continuous surface with the external you know surface okay i mean to the actually internal of the chest and when that happens you know this Bartholin's gland will remain open so that there could be frequent or ease you know drainage of you know the abscess of the abscess now of course you know you should actually accompany you know some kind of you know antibiotics to help you know in early you know treatment of the Bartholin's you know abscess so I mean that is one thing that we have to know about you know the Bartholin's you know gland Bartholin's gland but let me actually explain this to you let me actually explain it to you now look at this duct now assuming from here to here then we can have you know what we call the anterior two third then from here to here we can have actually what we have the posterior one third of the vulva so this Bartholin's gland okay the ducts will open you know at the junction between the anterior two thirds and the posterior third of you know the you know of the vulva of the vulva actually there's a groove over there and that groove is between the labia minora as well as you know the hymen opening in that you know kind of groove over there all right now i told you that the clitoris that we saw was just a tip of the iceberg now this is the real extent of the clitoris now this clitoris yes as i said is going to have hood we are going to have you know the actually the frenula okay then we are going to have the glands clitoris now remember that this organ is an you know erectile you know organ and therefore will be endowed with erectile tissue and the erectile tissues are located in its leg-like processes extensions that you find over here and those ones are known that there's the crura crura or the leg-like so one is cruise okay through a uh, crura of the clitoris now you get to know that yes within the crura are the you know the cavernous or they are the erectile structures that you find over there you know that's the corpus cavernosus corpus cavernosum so we have two of them and therefore we have what you call corpora cavernosa corpora cavernosa of in actually the crura of the i mean clitoris now one one thing that you know we have to actually know is that yes you can see i told you that we are going to have now there will be a muscle which will overlie this corpus you know actually this crura which will contain a corpus cavernosum and that is you know issue cavernosus muscle then this area which is deep okay to the skin deep to the skin that will overlie it okay actually in the vestibule area i told that is the vestibule and within the vestibule we have some openings opening of the urethra opening of the vagina now over here the this dilatations that you find over here part of the vestibule is known as bulb of the vestibule and that's why the muscle that overlie the the muscles that overlie these you know bulbs of vestibule are known as bulbospongiosus muscles bulbospongiosus okay so i mean that's what i want you to know regarding you know actually the clitoris actually the clitoris you know i've told you that yes female you know this one this uh, for males the clitoris is actually homologous to the penis penis in males penis in males all right now also part of the vulva okay or the external genitalia in females is the hymen is the hymen now hymen we have several of them you know but usually in children it is chrysanteric shape but we can have all these you know dynamics happening now you can see the the imperforate you know hymen okay the one which has not been perforated at all now usually if it's imperforable okay 
after several attempts of sexual intercourse, then what will happen is that it has to be done, you know, surgically. Okay, there should be surgical intervention to perforate this hymen. Then we can also have the annular type, okay, where you can have this almost oval shaped, you know, opening over here. Then you can have the septates, okay, you can see a septa between these two small openings over here. Then we can have the cribriform, just like the colander, okay, cribriform type. Then we can have the paros in troitus, you know, hymen. So the paros one, usually, you know, upon delivery, tend to find such a phenomenon, you know. Now, this actually hymen that we are talking about, you know, is actually a mucosal tissue, okay, which actually closes the opening of the vagina. And the opening of the vagina, I've told you that is called introitus, introitus, okay, introitus that you find over here. That's the opening of the vagina. Now, what it does is that it will partially, yes, of course, cover the opening of the vagina, okay. But, you know, one thing is that, in the olden days, I mean, we tend to use it to test, you know, virginity, uh, virginity, okay, so that we want to know that if a female has not had sexual intercourse before, we want to use this one to test. But right now, it's no longer, you know, recommended because, yes, you know, in the olden days, you know, prior to your first sexual intercourse with the male partner, you know, white cloth will be laid on a bed. And of course, after the sexual intercourse, come and check if there is blood in there. If there is blood, it means there is rapture. That's the first time the hymen, you know, has, you know, is rapturing, actually. If so, then the female is not a virgin. But the reason why it is no longer, you know, recommended, you know, is that, yes, you know, some of the hymen, okay, will be actually less rigid or will be easily perforable. So that even during vigorous exercise, you know, or physical activity, then what will happen is that, yes, it could get, I mean, I mean, perforated or who gets, you know, I mean, ruptured. Yes, even apart from that, yes, some females want to even actually try and perforate it themselves, you know, so we can actually actually get perforated, you know, themselves, actually. So that is one thing that we have to know, you know, regarding why we, want, we don't want to use this one to test, you know, virginity, to test virginity. So that is, you know, the hymen, the hymen. So these ones that we mentioned, you know, as being the vulva or the external female genitalia, okay, we've seen actually, yes, the mons pubis, we've seen labia majora, you know, labia minora, yes, we've seen, uh, I mean, clitoris, you know, greater vestibular gland, you know, we've seen actually the vestibule, and then of course, we've seen the hymen, the hymen, these, uh, I mean, represent what we call the external genitalia. Now, with the vasculature, okay, I mean, by way of blood vessels which are going to supply it, you know, arterial blood vessels which are going to supply it, yes, mainly its blood supply will be coming, you know, actually from what you call internal and external pudendal arteries. You know, this one, you can see the internal pudendal artery. And then, of course, you know, we also have the external pudendal artery. But, of course, remember that, you know, the internal pudendal artery will eventually drain into what we call the internal iliac, you know, artery. Now, of course, the external pudendal artery will actually, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, I mean, internal, you know, pudendal artery will actually, is a branch of what we call the internal iliac artery, internal iliac artery. And then, of course, you know, the, I mean, external, I mean, sorry, yes, external iliac artery is actually a branch of, you know the femoral you know artery femoral artery but you get to know that yes the internal pudendal artery will actually give off some perennial you know branches okay to actually supply it which will actually give further branches like the dorsal you know artery of the clitoris and of course the deep artery of the clitoris they all actually you know help you know supply you know blood to you know the vulva or the external genitalia external genitalia now, but remember that, yes, they will be drained, you know, actually by what we call, you know, the, I mean, the labial, you know, veins, okay, labial veins will actually drain them, you know, actually, and actually, you know, this labial vein is actually tributary of the pudendal, you know, veins, pudendal vein, so that's one thing. Now, with innervation, with nerve supply, 
with nerve supply then what happen is that we have to actually yes by way of yes, dividing it actually into two this way this imaginary line so that you can have anterior half of it and then posterior half of it so by way of cutaneous innervation through the posterior aspect you are going to have the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh okay we we'll give off some branches to supply it as well as of course you know we are going to have some you know perineal branches which will be coming from the pudendal nerve okay who actually also supply what we call the i mean the vulva the vulva and then of course for the anterior aspect we are going to have the ilioinguinal as well as genital branch of the genital femoral nerve genital femoral nerve now remember that the pudendal nerve you know its root value is s2 to s4 s2 to s4 now this is where we talk about you know instrument delivery so if a lady is going to get you know delivered of her fetus you know gravid you know a gravid lady going to get i mean pregnant woman going to get delivered of you know her fetus then what will happen is that if there is instrument by way of the use of forceps then what will happen is that you have to block you know the pudendal nerve because you'll be going through the perineum and the perineum i mean the main nerve supply will be the pudendal nerve so the i mean if it is instrument that we are going to use to deliver you know uh, let's say a female who is in labor then what will happen is that you have to block you know the pudendal nerve because the chief nerve supply to the perineal region so that it reduces you know the pain which is associated with it but there is one other thing regarding you know the innovation regarding the innovation importantly yes is you know i mean this kind of i mean innovation that you know we call it you know the cavernous nerves okay cavernous nerves over here now this cavernous nerves is actually coming from what we call the utero vaginal plexus utero vaginal plexus this one will give additional you know innovation to the clitoris as well as the vestibule of the vagina now this kind of innovation which is coming from the cavernous you know nerves okay is actually you know parasympathetic in nature parasympathetic in nature okay it's going to actually be parasympathetic in nature all right now by way of lymphatic drainage by way of lymphatic drainage what will happen is that yes generally the vulva will be drained into what we call the superficial inguinal lymph nodes which will then drain into the deep inguinal lymph nodes and then into the pelvic you know lymph nodes but what will happen is that this drainage can occur ipsilaterally or it can occur you know contralaterally so that if it's ipsilateral then that particular part of the vulva will drain to that side which is related to the superficial deep and of course to the pelvic you know lymph nodes but if it's contralateral then from one side of the vulva it will drain to the opposite aspect of the superficial inguinal lymph node deep and of course to the pelvic you know lymph nodes but one thing that we have to know is that the clitoris okay will drain actual dilatory okay into the deep inguinal lymph nodes will drain directly into the deep inguinal you know lymph nodes and that one that deep inguinal lymph node that the vagina is draining into yes is known as lymph node of crockwort lymph node of crockwort now so that's the deep inguinal lymph node lymph node of crockwort yes straight from actually the clitoris or also call this lymph node known as resembles lymph nodes so lymph node of crockwort resembles lymph node or deep inguinal lymph node but giant as well the clitoris will drain directly into them so that is actually the external genitalia or that is the uh, you know the i mean the vulva that we've seen but connecting the external genitalia to what we call the uterus which is part of the inter internal organs of the female reproductive system yes is the vagina is the vagina so let's look at this vagina now apart from the vagina being an organ for you know sexual intercourse for actually for population or you know mating yes or coitus yes actually the vagina is also going to serve as the lower part of the bed canal remember that the upper part will be coming from the service 
so majority actually of the birth canal will be coming from the vagina apart from that it's also going to be the side through which i mean the channel through which you know manly discharge of you know the menses blood flow will go through so that is with the vagina yes as you can see it's over here this is the external genitalia trying to show you the labium minus okay this is the vagina okay this is actually a long tube fibromuscular long tube now this is actually a coronal section okay of the female reproductive system and therefore these ones represent the lateral aspects okay so you can see that with the wall laterally they tend to have almost the same length yes laterally are going to have the same length now within the mucous membrane of the vagina the vagina is thrown into fours now these fours are known as vagina rugi and what they are going to do yes the vagina is actually fibromuscular you know actually elastic as well so that i can accommodate i mean increasing size of the penis okay i mean increase size of the penis whichever irrespective of the size of the penis so that the vagina can actually accommodate it even with the head of the fetus or the body of the fetus as it goes through it during parturition it should be able to i mean stretch you know and it's going to be by the concavity of the vaginal rugi now remember that yes i mean let me show you this the vagina yes this is the anterior wall now this from here this anterior this posterior because you can see the gluteal area okay so the vagina is over here it's actually sandwiched between the urinary bladder anteriorly and the rectum posteriorly so it's in between them this is the vagina this is actually the sagittal section okay sagittal section through you know the female reproductive the pelvic region actually so that we can show the vagina so this one over here we can see the anterior wall and over here you can see the posterior wall so you get to know that unlike the two lateral walls for the anterior walls anterior wall is shorter compared to the lateral wall so that yes the anterior wall will measure roughly 7.5 centimeters and then the posterior wall will measure around 9.0 centimeters roughly on average now what we find is that yes um, anterior to the posterior aspect if nothing is entering the vagina whether it's penis or anything then what happens is that the vagina will be collapsed will be collapsed it's normally collapsed in that regard but if something enters then it becomes patent for it to go through now remember that now you see the vagina is just like let's say cap cap so that this superior structure over here that you see is the uterus is sitting inside the vagina now the neck of the uterus which we call the cervix actually protrudes into the scap which we are calling the vagina and therefore it creates some vaults okay some vaults will be created now these vaults are known as furnaces on the lateral aspect you have lateral furnaces on the anterior aspect we have anterior furnace and in the posterior aspect we have posterior furnace so you get to see that the anterior furnace is shallower shallow compared to that of the you know posterior furnace posterior furnace now within the wall of the vagina you know actually the anterior aspect of the vagina you know actually you know one two three you know inch okay deep to it you know there is this area which they call it you know with a lot of nerve tissues around that area so that's also an area which is highly you know erogenous so that it can even lead to what we call orgasm in females and that area is known as the grafenberg you know spot which you often shorten it as the g spot but of course within this wall vagina yes you may have even the u spot you may even have you know some other spot like the old spots you know can be in there can be in there all right so that is the vagina yes even around this area you can have the a spot so there are several spots but you know the well recognized one that we talk about is the g spot which is about one to three inch deep to the vagina anterior wall of the vagina so i mean that is one thing that we have to know now having talked about these furnaces or these vaults the posterior furnace is very important yes the posterior furnace is going to be a natural reservoir for actually sperm 
so that roughly after about you know 20 minutes this area it will get liquefied so that it can easily penetrate you know the service to enter you know the you trying you know i mean you trying to okay get into the ampulla actually to fed, cause fertilization to meet actually the you know the secondary i mean the secondary oocytes okay to get it you know fertilized so i mean that is you know one thing that you know we have to you know actually know now the epithelial lining of the vagina is actually stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium yes so that the issue so that yes you know several things are going in there different sides of penis entering it you know even the head or the fetus is actually going through it so it means that it's subject to a lot of friction and abrasion you know and therefore you know it has to be really robust to actually confer that kind of protection to the vagina and it's doing that because it is having the stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium but one thing is that people who tend to have sex quite often yes just like the sex workers it may actually get you know actually some kind of keratin may be seen in there you know and the histological sections you may see some keratin which tells us that keratin is going to confer even more protection so it tells you that because of high you know demand of the vagina almost every day every time then what happens that the body will have to make it more robust by actually keratinizing you know the superficial cells so that is with the vagina now within the vagina yes there are also some kind of um, you know normal flora which we call them dawdlings you know bacteria normal flora in there or normal commensals harboring this you know vagina now these i mean dawdlings bacteria are actually specifically known as lactobacillus acidophilus so lactobacilli i mean rush shaped you know bacteria over there and what they are going to do is that they are going to actually produce i mean lactic acid through fermentation of glucose so remember that yes within the vagina epithelium we are going to have what you call i mean glycogen will be stored there this glycogen will have to be metabolized broken down into glucose and then further broken down into lactic acid so that we always want to keep this vagina environment you know actually having an acidic ph you know roughly 4.5 4.5 you know ph of 4.5 now it is very important to ensure that this ph you know is maintained you know so that you can actually ward off other opportunistic you know infections happening in here because these opportunistic infections the causative organism will have to harbor in there if there is low actually uh, low hydrogen ion you know around here or there is high ph if the area becomes alkaline or less acidic then it becomes prone to opportunistic you know infections you know talk about candida albicans harboring this area to cause you know candidiasis or white you know around this area but one thing is that yes this vaginal acidic environment is also going to be hostile to the sperm cell and that is why you know it's important that they i mean human male will produce a lot of millions of sperms you know on average 250 million sperms will be produced per ejaculate so that most of them will get you know sacrificed in the vaginal you know environment because of the high acidity will neutralize it so that the later slow ones will actually get the chance to get into the uterine you know tube actually but having talked about yes talking about acidity over here yes maximum vaginal acidity there could be fluctuations in the ph i said that 4.5 is the ph but the maximum vaginal acidity you know is seen during actually you know pregnancy during pregnancy because of course nature recognizes that yes during pregnancy there is fetus over here which you know hasn't committed any sin and therefore have to be protected you know but of course we know that the service will close anyway but anything which will harbor i mean which can actually cause any infection around here is prevented therefore maximum acidity of the vagina is seen during pregnancy yes i mean apart from that yes what we have to know is that minimum acidity of the vagina okay is actually seen you know during menstruation the menstrual phase of the menstrual cycle 
okay the bleeding phase so that's what will happen is that because blood we know blood the ph of blood is around you know 7.35 to 7.45 you know slightly alkaline therefore as more blood flows through it it tends to you know somewhat neutralize the you know acidic environment you know to make it less acidic less acidic so it tells us that yes during menstruation females can be prone actually to you know several you know kind of infections around you know this tract this vagina actually now having looked at that yeah, let's also look at the neighboring organs or neighboring viscera which are related to the vagina now anterior relations okay so anteriorly we are going to have this so anteriorly at the superior portion we are going to have the urinary bladder relating to it and at its inferior aspect we are going to have the urethra related to it now the posterior aspect we are going to divide it into three you know we're going to have the upper third middle third and then the lower third portions of it now the upper third okay we see this is related to this one now this one is between the rectum the initial portion of the rectum as well as you know the uterus therefore you call it rectal uterine pouch rectal uterine pouch which is otherwise known as pouch of douglas or that's the coup de sac okay coup de sac is over here so that is the rectal uterine pouch relating to it actually posteriorly okay posterior third of you know vagina relating to it then apart from that yes we are also going to have you know actually the middle third okay so the middle third is over here and the middle third will actually be related more to the ampulla of you know the rectum ampulla of the rectum and then you know so that's the ampulla of you know the rectum and then the lower third okay will be related to what we call the perineal body okay perineal body will be there as well as of course the anal canal posterior inferior aspect okay posteriorly the, i mean inferior third related to you know perineal body central tendon of perineum as well as of course the anal canal but on its lateral aspects laterally we can see this muscle that's the you know the pelvic floor muscles okay mainly beta a9 yes consisting of you know pubic coxygeus iliocoxygeus as well as of course you know the coxygeus you know muscle itself or issue coxygeus muscle then even apart from this yes the ureter actually the pelvic part of the ureter we relate to it laterally laterally then in addition there is this ligament which will actually get attachment to you know what we call the service okay which therefore we call it transverse cervical or lateral cervical you know ligaments which is otherwise you know known as cardinal ligament or otherwise known as McEnroth ligament McEnroth ligament now this ligament will also relate to it you know laterally laterally but remember that these you know ligaments will actually provide some kind of partial support to the uterus now I've indicated already that the vagina is going to have the epithelial line. This is actually a longitudinal section through the vagina. Okay, so uh, on the right side you can see this epithelial line. And now for the epithelial line, the stratified squamous non keratinized So you can see the epithelial pecs dipping into it. Okay, the epithelial pecs actually dipping into it, and then. We are also going to have here yeah, beneath the epithelial lining, we are go going to have loose connective tissue of lamina propria. Okay, lamina propria will be there, as you can see. And then below that, we are going to have two layers of muscle. Okay, inner circular, outer longitudinal bite. It appears ill defined. Okay, as you can see over here, it's ill defined. So we say it's actually fibromuscular. So connective tissue also, I mean, infiltrating it actually and then we are also going to have the adventitia adventitia it will uh, i mean have you know serosa it will have adventitia because it is subperitoneal or extraperitoneal structure extraperitoneal you know structure 
so i mean that is one thing that we are seeing i mean this again the epithelial lining you can see the dips of the connective tissue i mean the lamina propria so it's actually going to have three coats the epithelium plus the lamina propria forming one of the coats which we call it you know mucosa and then of course the fibromuscular coat okay having inner circular outer longitudinal but it's actually ill defined anyway giving us this kind of i mean now remember that the muscle is actually smooth muscle vagina is going to have smooth muscle okay but there's connective tissue infiltration high infiltration of connective tissue so these are the muscle fibers that you find but there's high infiltration of connective tissue and therefore you say it's fibromuscular coat that second coat or the muscle coat and then we're also going to have what you call the adventitia adventitia so that it can glue the vagina to neighboring you know structures neighboring structures all right now when you look at the epithelium epithelium we are saying that we are going to have what you call simple you know i mean uh square so scratified squamous non keratinized epithelial tissue but what we are going to find is that yes there will be some kind of changes in the shape of these i mean cells now the squamous cells we could have parabasal cell okay we could have what we call intermediate cell and then we could have what's called superficial cell so of course from superficial to deep we are going to have superficial intermediate and parabasal cells now depending on the state i mean the stage of the menstrual cycle we have predominance of a particular type of you know cell and of course if you are talking about the stage of the menstrual cycle then we are talking about the hormone the predominant hormone in there now this parabasal cell as you can also see here okay is seen where there is balance okay where there is balance between estrogen or estradiol and progesterone and progesterone so that's when we are going to see a lot of you know parabasal you know cells now as you can see these parabasal cells are actually mature very mature because we said that they will be developing this way so the, the parabasal cell very mature it's going to have roughly rounded or oval nucleus you know the nucleus is actually greater so you look at the cytoplasm so we say that the ratio between the nucleus and the cytoplasm is actually going to be one is to two roughly one is to two approximately one is to two okay so that's with the parabasal cell then what happens is that it's going to have what you call vesicular nucleus okay so with the vesicular nucleus i mean what i actually mean is that it's going to have what we call a central pallor which yes usually we can't really appreciate it over here but it's supposed to have a pale staining area yes i mean centrally as you can see but the outer rim is deeper so if you can see it over there the outer rim is deeper but i mean more centrally it appears pale so it shows you know vesicular staining but of course if you look at the cytoplasm closely it appears granular as well granular as well all right now so this one will mature okay to become what we call the intermediate cell now in intermediate cell we have the small intermediate cell and then we have the large intermediate cell of course for the small intermediate cell yes you can see you know roughly oval in shape with actually a prominent i mean nucleus so the nucleus over here is quite prominent compared to the nucleus of the large intermediate type so that what will happen is that for i mean the para i mean for the intermediate type what we find is that generally they will be twice as larger as that of the parabasal cell okay although this one is not showing it but what happens is that we expect that the intermediate cells are larger compared to I mean or broader compared to the parabasal you know I mean cell okay now for I mean you can see they are you know for the large one okay it's not roughly oval compared to this one so we can see this one is you know actually polygonal 
or polyhedra, so to speak. Okay, so that is one term that we find. But for the small one, you get to know that there will be, I mean, it's going to have small nucleus. Therefore, there will be, I mean, the ratio of the nucleus to cytoplasm will be small compared to that of the small intermediate you know, type. Then, of course, they will also differentiate so from small, intermediate to large, intermediate, and then eventually to become the superficial type, which is the mature, I mean, type which of course through disquamation will get shared so the superficial type yes i mean so one thing is that the intermediate type we are going to see it more when you know in actual the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle or the post ovulatory phase where of course that one the predominant hormone will be progesterone now for superficial type it is going to be seen more where we have estradiol or estrogen dominance Okay, so where we have more estrogen than progesterone, then we are going to see a lot of the superficial, you know, type. Now, one thing is that this superficial type, yes, in under H. A. Einstein, we expect that the cytoplasm is actually eosinophilic, eosinophilic, and you can see the shape is just resembling that of the large intermediate type. So it's also poly, you know, gonal, polygonal. But you can see that even the nucleus is smaller, has become even more smaller with a lot of cytoplasm in the abundance of cytoplasm now the nucleus we describe the nucleus at this stage to be actually pycnotic okay it's getting to almost a time where it is going to get fragmented okay so that if it's for instance under skin then we expect that if it gets fragmented because we have a lot of you know i mean keratin in there then what will happen is that it becomes what we call, I mean, um, you know, keratinized, keratinized. But if it fails to lose its nucleus with a lot of keratin in there, then we say it is para-keratinized, para-keratinized. Okay, so, I mean, that is that that we are going to see. Uh, well, you know, you know, talking about keratin, mainly keratohyaline, you know, which will be very important in making uh, an impermeable you know force around so that more less water or any force cannot you know penetrate it so that is with the cell type that we find okay so from all the way from parabasal to intermediate and then to you know the so where there is balance parabasal cell where there's balance between estrogen and progesterone then what will happen is that you have a lot of parabasal cell where progesterone yes you know becomes more i mean more predominant then what will happen is that we see a lot of the intermediate cells and then where estrogen is dominant we see a lot of superficial cells so with the vasculature of the vagina with the vasculature of the vagina yes the blood supply to the vagina vagina is going to have you know blood supply actually coming from what we call the vaginal artery you know mainly vaginal artery which is you know actually you know coming from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery a branch of the anterior division of internal iliac artery they also have what we call the uterine artery uterine artery will give a descending branch to the vagina and we call it the descendant you know i mean branch of i mean descendant uterine branch okay which we actually can also call the descendant vaginal artery. Then, apart from that, we also have what we call the middle rectal, you know, artery, middle rectal artery. So these ones will be the main, yes, blood supply to what we call the, I mean, the vagina, the vagina, main blood supply to the vagina. But one thing is that with respect to I mean drainage okay there is this plexus plexus of veins venous plexus around the vagina area so we call it vaginal venous plexus this vaginal venous plexus will actually drain into what we call the uterine vein which will then drain into the internal iliac vein so that is the venous drainage of the vagina by the vaginal venous plexus draining into uterine vein and then 
into what we call the internal iliac vein which also drain into the common iliac and then to the of course you know abdominal you know aorta okay sorry i mean common iliac veins then of course into the inferior vena cava inferior vena cava now with with regards to the development of you know the vagina the vagina will have you know upper to test portion which is you know continuous with of course the uterus and of course fallopian tubes they will all be actually developed from what we call the millennium duct millennium duct to actually develop i mean give rise to these structures then the lower third of the vagina will actually develop from what we call urogenital swelling urogenital swelling now with lymphatic drainage of the vagina yes the vagina is going to have yes with the lymphatic drainage we divide into three upper third middle third and of course lower third the upper third will actually drain into what we call the external you know i mean iliac you know group of lymph nodes external iliac group of lymph nodes then the middle third will drain into what we call the internal iliac group of lymph nodes and then of course the lower third will actually drain into what we call the the superficial i mean inguinal lymph nodes superficial inguinal lymph nodes so i mean that is one thing that we are going to see with a vagina you know regarding its you know lymphatic you know drainage lymphatic drainage now remember that yes the vagina yes i mean regards to you know because it is related to other viscera around there then there could be connection developmentally could be a problem where there's fissula there's connection between any of the adjacent you know structures and one of the, I mean, if we have such a thing, we are calling it fissula, fissula. And in fissula, we are going to have, you know, uh, for instance, we are going to have three main group of them. We are going to have what you call the vesicle vaginal. So vesicle has to do with urinary bladder and a vagina. So in such a situation, there's that connection between the vagina and, you know, the, I mean, the urinary bladder you know anterospirally so that if there could be drainage of urine into the vagina then we can also have utero vaginal fistula so that between the urethra and the vagina so that during micturation during urination then urine can actually enter you know the vagina then of course we can also have the rectal vaginal you know fistula where there's connection between the rectum and the vagina of course we've seen those relations so in such a phenomenon then of course fecal matter can you know get into the vagina get into the vagina then there are other disorders that we have to actually know about you know the vagina you know talking about actually you know dyspareunia dyspareunia so dyspareunia that is you know painful you know uh, pain i mean painful sexual you know intercourse Dyspareunia. Most women, yes, it's estimated about one third of women who may have experienced, I mean, pain during sexual intercourse. And that is what we call dyspareunia, dyspareunia, painful sexual intercourse. Now, sometimes the vagina may become diseased where there will be the need to remove the vagina so that it doesn't affect, you know, for instance, the uterus or any other or spread to other areas. For instance, if there's cancer of the vagina, then the vagina will have to be removed at some stage. And that is the removal of vagina is known as vaginectomy now sometimes too there is that kind of involuntary you know contraction of the walls of the vagina the smooth muscles of the vagina as something is about entering it for instance during sexual intercourse as the male tries to you know put in the i mean penis into the vagina then the vagina begin to you know contract involuntarily painfully and in such a case we call it you know vaginismus vaginismus or vaginism so vaginismus that is involuntary contraction is very painful so that one is actually going to actually impede or you know hinder sexual you know intercourse now there could be bacterial infection mainly bacterial infection you know happening around the vagina area you know which will be i mean odoriferous you know quite you know painful sometimes and that is what we call vaginosis 
So if we talk about vaginosis, we are talking about bacterial infection that happen, you know, within the vagina. Bacterial infection that happen within the vagina, vaginosis. But if this bacterial infection is persists, it can lead to what you call vaginitis, which is inflammation of the vagina, inflammation of the vagina. Now, yes, apart from infection, which will cause vaginitis, yes, it could be allergy. Yes, I mean, that kind of things could, anything that's, you know, maybe injurious to the vagina could lead to inflammation of the vagina, which we call it vaginitis. If the vulva is also included, okay, any of the vulva is included, then we call it vulvo vaginitis, vulvo vaginitis, vulvo vaginitis. So you can have vulvo vaginitis, okay, inflammation of both the vulva as well as, you know, the vagina. As well as the vagina so i mean that is you know one thing that we are going to see man i talked about the fistula now fistula apart from you know happening you know there's connection with the other viscera apart from happening you know developmentally being a developmental anomaly it can also happen you know from you know continuous you know stress of you know the wall of you know the vagina okay so especially where there is prolonged, you know, labor, prolonged labor, then what happens? The patient will be going through, I mean, contract trying to push, and of course it may lead to that kind of, you know, fistula, you know, formation in there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you find this video helpful, and I will look at the other bits of the female reproductive system in later section of ours. All right, may God richly bless you.